Ever since the dawn of time, there has been a common answer to a very specific question. What is the worst Pokemon game of all time? There are two answers you'll hear all the time, Pokemon Sword and Shield, and the games that we'll be discussing today being Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Now, before even typing a word in the comment section, I'm not saying that these are the greatest games ever made. That's not even the point I'm trying to make today. Instead, today we'll be taking these games, also known as the 17th installment to the mainline series, and a spiritual reimagining of Pokemon Yellow, and we will determine if they are even been bad at all. So without further ado, your timestamps are on screen. Now let's begin this critical breakdown and watch as these games attempt to stand on their own legs. The best place to start would have to be the gameplay, since these games easily change the most amount of gameplay related stuff in the entire series. First up is the Wild Encounters. These games have had a major departure from the typical Wild Encounter scene. Now the Wild Encounters mirror that of what exists in Pokemon Go, but instead of a touchscreen, we have motion controls and of course they don't even work half the time awesome stunning really but getting back on track with this change to catching pokemon they somehow removed the ability to actually battle all of the wild encounters in the game but surprisingly the old wild encounter battle system is technically still in the game but only for a few select battles that can't be repeated being examples like snorlax electrode and the legendaries which can be found on the overworld and of course have to be interacted with which again is odd since snorlax and the legendary bird can be obtained again without even battling them that way. So why? Regardless, with the catching out of the way and the game's primary focus, let's take a glance at the battles themselves. There have been many cuts to dumb down the existing battle experience, which recreates that of what we had in Generation 1 and 2. So what does this mean? The removal of a lot. Abilities? Gone. Z-moves? Also gone. Held items? Cast away. EVs? Say it with me gone. But this was also replaced with, and I quote, a new system that allows you to gain multiple stats at once while still working exactly the same as EVs. Does this sound familiar? Because surprise, once again, this was something similar that we had back in the glory days. So instead of being able to optimize your Pokemon across two stats, now it's like in the first two generations where you can cap off all the stats on your Pokemon, allowing them to have extra bulk and better offenses. For the casual audience in which these games were intended for, it works, but with the casual audience in mind, the um, CP power gimmick thing from Pokemon Go also exists, but ultimately does nothing. Regardless, somehow Mega Evolution just wasn't cut from the game. This time around, there's no held items, so now there's not even a downside to choosing a Mega Evolution over an item, which as such has no drawbacks now. At least they tried to balance Mega Evolution this time around by restricting its use throughout the game, and by that I mean four Mega Evolutions can only be used throughout the main story, being that of the three starter Pokemon. And the fact that you only get access to the mechanic after beating the seven gems before the last one just limits how long you can break the game for. Regardless of that, we have two game-breaking mechanics to talk about, so let's start with the returning feature, the affection boost from X and Y onwards. For the first, and certainly not the last time, the friendship mechanics and the affection mechanics were merged. Just like how we later saw in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. But however, unlike in the context of those games, the difference here is that most of the game is just an honest joke. I can talk about the difficulty later, but the affection boost this time, while unavoidable, cannot be removed in an easy manner like in those games. So the next game breaking addition we have to speak about is somehow more unfair to the game than the last one. This is two player play. At most points in the game, a second player can join your game by connecting their Joy-Con and shaking it. This will spawn another trick. Trainer. While on the overworld, it doesn't do anything really. Seriously, they can't even interact with wild Pokemon, trainer, or items. Which reminds me, the wild encounters in these games are contact encounters. It's neat, I suppose. Now you don't even need to use repels to avoid wild Pokemon. And the shiny Pokemon found in the wild will actually appear shiny in the overworld. But back on the track of two-player play, in battle, co-op play becomes more problematic than Mega Evolution or Dynamax could ever dream of. Because again, if the second player is in the game, or once again, again can join mid-battle, turning any battle into a 2v1. Yes, you heard that right. 2 versus 1. I really don't need to explain how dumb this is, but having two actions at once is easily the most broken gameplay option you could ask for. Sure, it's completely optional, but that really doesn't matter. Anyways, two-player catching can also be a little bit annoying, with just how many Pokeballs that you can just burn through. But should both players land their Pokeballs at the same time, you get a synchronized catch, which increases your catch rate and EXP gain. But oh wait, 
Wait, EXP. What a fun little segment to the strangest adjustment to these games. So you know how in every other single game in the series, how it's more optimal to battle trainer Pokemon to level up rather than grinding the wild Pokemon, as trainer Pokemon typically give more EXP? Well, for some reason, I suppose to incentivize catching Pokemon, it is far better to catch the Pokemon for EXP this time around rather than trainers, which feels like an absolute sin. Because now, the only reason you'd even battle trainers at all is for money. Okay, just look at this gameplay. I was just trying to get through Victory Road, and I found a Rhydon. I had no clue what I was getting myself into, as the Rhydon gave my Pokemon nearly 7,000 EXP points. And this 17.6 multiplier doesn't even have the first ball catch multiplier. It's honestly baffling how much EXP you can get in this manner. That, on top of the EXP share always being on from the start and cannot be turned off, all you need is one hour at best, and you won't have to grind at all for the rest of your run. But as the battle-related stuff is kind of done, we'll just talk about everything else. So as I mentioned at the start of this video, these games are spiritual reimaginings of Pokemon Yellow. So once again, we are back in Kanto, the best region ever conceived. So the lands are familiar to say the least, but the game's progression is as non-linear as always. But of course, as a game releasing in Generation 7, you aren't bound to the grid of movement like in the other Kanto games. But unlike Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, the collision isn't completely unbearable. On the topic of movement, the bike was removed. However, we have have a redemption story of a feature to replace it. And I hate to say this, but that feature is Pokemon following you. So this feature can be toggled whenever from your Pokemon menu. However, certain Pokemon, when pulled out in this manner, you are capable of riding on. Something like Arcanine, Tauros, or Rhyhorn, which can allow you to move faster while riding them. And even furthermore, after beating the game, Charizard, Dragonite, and Aerodactyl will allow you to fly around on them in the sky, negating the entire need to use Surf. But speaking of Surf, the former HMs need to be addressed. Thankfully, this time around, gym badges aren't required to use the replacements for the overworld HMs. Sure, unlocking these is very similar to how they were in the original games, Flash, Cut, and Strength are unlocked the same way as they were before. Fly, on the other hand, being obtainable after the Team Rocket hideout stuff is nice, and Surf doesn't even require an unnecessary trip to the Safari Zone because, well, let's talk about that. So in terms of cut content from the previous Kanto iterations, the Safari Zone is gone. This has been replaced with the Go Park Complex. This place existed so you could transfer your Pokemon up from Pokemon Go. But then Pokemon Home happened and made this obsolete. Why is that? It's simple really. Much like the Pal Park in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, you had to recatch the Pokemon. Problem is, you have to do it from your Pokeball supply. So you could just end up wasting more Pokeballs than you otherwise should. One could argue they removed the Sevy Islands from Fire Red and Leaf Green from these games as well. However, this wasn't something from Yellow, so you could argue it wasn't even removed at all, but whatever. Less play space, I suppose. Speaking of stuff cut from the game, it's time to speak on the Pokedex selection, because here's how many Pokemon are obtainable in these games. 150. Here's how many Pokemon are transferable into the game by any means. 153. No, I'm not joking. This is the full roster. It's literally just the original 151 from the original Pokemon games, with the additions of Meltan and Melmetal, which were only previously and still only obtainable in Pokemon Go. So back to what I said about that Pokemon list, only having that list is repetitive to say the least, considering it's the fourth Kanto visit that we've had with a roster that is basically unchanged. Sure, the Alolan forms of Pokemon from this era also exist in the game, but they have to be traded for in-game, which is a problem because that means no trainers are going to use them. Regardless, this list, while nostalgic, is beyond lame, because we easily could have had the evolutions of these Pokemon introduced in later generations, but the game said no. The thing is that ultimately baffles me with this decision is that the community just didn't seem to care, because these games were the first mainline Pokedex cuts as we know it, and yet at no point did the community fall apart and start the embarrassment that we know as today as hashtag bring back national decks. You remember the whole thing where people started crying on Twitter and sending death threats? Alright, whatever. Let's move on to the main playthrough. Overall, this game's progression assumes that you would 
would do the gems in their proper order, so the level curve isn't as problematic as, let's say, gold and silver, for instance, but you can still do them out of order. But speaking about the gems, they're a little bit different this time around. This time, each gem has a requirement before you can actually enter and participate in the gym. But this means each gym has some arbitrary requirements that you have to meet before you can even battle them. But not at all gyms even have this. This being the case for Lieutenant Surge, Blaine, and Giovanni. However, in the cases of Misty and Sabrina, you will need a Pokemon to at least be a certain level. Helpful for pacing your level curve, although in the case of Sabrina's gym, makes it to where you'll have a Pokemon that's a higher level than her whole team, which is a minor concern. Erica's gym requires you to bring a cute Pokemon. For some reason, this exists despite your starter existing, but um, yeah. Thanks, Gyarados. Brock's gym requires you to have a grass or water type in your party. And finally, the problematic one, Koga. To do this gym, you have to obtain 50 different Pokemon for your Pokedex, which could be a major pace breaker if you're not aiming for it or don't know about it in advance. However, on the other hand, it is nice to need to catch these Pokemon for leveling reasons, because surprise, I haven't even gotten to the level curve yet. So the level curve received if some minor tweaks, most notably the nerf to the levels of the E4 teams. Specifically, their levels, but the movesets I'll touch on in a few. But overall, with how cracked the wild encounters can be, and I cannot stress this enough, can be for EXP, but overall, EXP is isn't too bad, because you only really need to grind at two points during the entire game, once after getting out of Rock Tunnel, and then once again before the Pokemon League. All around, not an absolute chore to play like the Johto games. Regardless, looking at the gyms and the Elite Four, what on God's green earth are these movesets? Between the gym leaders and the Elite Four, only Koga, Sabrina, and Giovanni have one Pokemon or more with a full moveset of four. How on earth is this even an issue? Okay. Okay, okay, I won't lose my cool, but please, just look at the image of Brock's Geodude real quick. I rest my case. Also, why does Lance, a Dragon-type trainer, only have one Dragon-type? Like, I get it with Deceidra, I get the reference of it evolving into a Dragon, but again, Kingdra is just not in the game at all, so why is this just not a Dragonair? With the main playthrough aside, what about the post-game? Well, other than additional story pieces that I'll talk about near the end, Cerulean Cave is unlocked again. Gem Leader rematches in the Elite Four Round 2 are also unlocked, but these don't require much explanation. Just go back to the Gems or the Elite Four, and then you can fight their enhanced teams. In the case of the Elite Four, they get access to some Alolan forms, and Lance specifically gets to Mega Evolve his Charizard. The new post-game feature is the Master Trainers. Basically, these are trainers which you battle one-on-one -on -one with the same Pokemon that they have. The thing here is that there's one of these for every single Pokemon in the game, which could easily turn into a long goose chase to find every single one of them, and since these trainers have Pokemon in the higher level ranges, there's a grind wall that you will have to work for. Ultimately, if you've enjoyed the games up to this point, this is a massive time sink for you to consider investing in. Speaking of investments, it's a little crazy how I've gone this far without talking about the starter Pokemon. So, in these games, much like in Pokemon Yellow, your starter is chosen for you. That, of course, is the Pokemon on the box art and the title of the game you are playing. This starter is unique in many ways. For example, they cannot evolve, they have increased stats that a normal Pikachu and Eevee wouldn't have, as well as having exclusive move tutors that have access to some of the most unfair attacks I have ever seen. Pikachu literally gets a priority attack that always crits, as well as a few others that are underwhelming in comparison. Eevee gets eight exclusive attacks, each of types as its evolutions as a nice little reference. Highlights include attacks that can guarantee burn, paralysis, it can either set up screens, even activating haze, or even applying Gleech Seed. But that aside, your partner Pikachu or Eevee does have a menu where you can actually play with them, basically scrapping Pokemon on me to focus on just the one Pokemon. This menu also restores your HM replacements. This can easily be accessed by player one just shaking their Joy-Con, where stuff involving your partner Pokemon includes customization. So, not only is trainer customization returning, but to improve upon that, you can even dress up your partner Pikachu or Eevee. Following modern trends since Generation 5, TMs are now unlimited use, as well as Generation 7 trends like no more HMs and hyper training being a thing. The move reminder actually exists this time after not being a thing in yellow. This is found at the Pokemon League. Why is this thing so late in the game again? There was also a well-warranted addition to the game, and this is your ability to access the PC from literally anywhere. Cutscene skip was also added to the options as well, to, you know, skip cutscenes. 
The issue here is these games don't really have enough cutscenes for it to be helpful enough, but the thought does count. Online play was toned down a bit since the last games, now we only have online trading and battling. That's actually all, it's just the basics. And finally, what served to be basically a scam is the Pokeball Plus. This controller attempted to replicate the Pokewalker that sold with Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. But the issue here is, this controller was not free with the game. You had to pay extra for it. Sure, you could play the game with it, but ultimately, you couldn't catch Pokemon using it. You're just getting EXP and items, where getting both of which is just easier by playing the game. But overall, that's basically everything. There is a massive lack of content in these games. So I suppose it's time to discuss the story changes since they actually managed to adjust it some. So as a spiritual reimagining of Pokemon Yellow, pretty much everything from that game's story is here. So the barrenness that we had with Team Rocket being criminals, and you as a child trying to stop them. Jesse and James from the anime are here as well, and are the only native double battles seemingly in this game. Regardless, there is some new stuff, so I'll start front to back. You have a new rival, and good lord, you can actually name them. This young fella is lame, man. A coward even? I honestly don't know how he even becomes champ for your battle at the end of the game. But for some reason, they decided as fan service, and because timeline continuity doesn't need to exist, Blue, your rival from the old Kanto games, is in the game despite you having a new rival. So he shows up randomly on your adventure and isn't even that important to the story. But ultimately, they attempted to use him to add continuity to him being a gym leader in Harko and Soul Silver. But this also has an inverse effect, as in those games, the guy who greets you at the entrance refers to him as the guy who battled the champion. Obviously, because he was the champion and lost the title. Now, there's a problem with him never being the champion, which completely screws this up. And now Red never becomes the champion either, which again, messes that one up as well. And despite him being a super boss for the game, he's pretty much just irrelevant, and only there for fan service. Which screws up the continuity even further with Heart Gold and Soul Silver, because again, Red doesn't become champion, and now he never stops Team Rocket. Anyways, enough of this nonsense with Blue. There's now a scene before Rock Tunnel with Lorelei, and this really didn't need to be in the game. But it is nice to see the Elite Four member, who was robbed of their post-game story thanks to the Sevi Islands just not being present, at least attempt to do something. Next up is the Cubone story piece. Basically, this exists to give the Marowak in the Pokemon Tower purpose, and is used to lock you from progressing to the Rocket Hideout until after your first visit to the Lavender Tower, meaning that now you have to make two trips here. A little annoying, but fair, I suppose. Considering how they made a mess with Heart Gold and Soul Silver's continuity, something they seem to have done fine with was including the admin archer to the game. Yes, the clown from the radio tower in Heart Gold Soul Silver, who only appeared once in the game and had a Pokemon that wasn't even obtainable in Johto. They added him, obviously for fan service, in continuity which, for the most part, works since he isn't just some random dude trying to reforge Team Rocket in those games. And lastly for story adjustments is the post-game. So, Cerulean Cave post-game is different this time. The first trip is the same, you go to Cerulean Cave, you go catch your Mewtwo, right? But the second trip is to go find the other person who went to go find Mewtwo, and this is Green. She's basically the female protagonist from Fire Red and Leaf Green, but to technically to be nerdy about it, she's actually from the manga, because the Blastoise on her team is a reference to that. Thank you, Reddit. Thankfully, this bit with the post-game makes there actually something to do, despite still being short. But that's all. The story is still very minimalistic, and as such, I've basically covered everything there is about these games. So let's just finish this. At the end of the day, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee aren't good games. At their core, these are games trying to spin a new twist in the classic Pokemon formula with some modern mechanics. A game that actively incentivizes skipping as many trainers as possible, and instead, catch as many Pokemon as you physically can. These are games with controversial changes, with an even lower difficulty cap than the last two games to release both before and arguably after. Ideas new and old that don't mix too well, that create a very lacking experience. Not bad, it just doesn't fulfill any desires basically any other game in the series could provide other than fan service. At its best, these are games that can be enjoyed and are made for casuals significantly more than any other mainline game up to this point. My final score, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, is a mediocre 3.3 out of 10. It's a functional game, and not a complete and utter chore to play, that also is just accessible to basically everyone. 
Hey, you clicking off the video, subscribe right now. Do it for Afro Pikachu and Bald Eevee.